connected by purpose, driven by passion. This is Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. Children's Healthcare Canada would like to thank the following Keystone funding partners for their ongoing contributions that support all of our programs and activities. The Stollery Children's Hospital Foundation, BC Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital at London Health Sciences Centre, the Alberta Children's Hospital Foundation, the Children's Hospital of Eastern Ontario, and Holland Blurview Kids Rehabilitation Hospital. We would also like to thank the organizations that provide funding for our knowledge translation activities, which includes this Spark Live webinar series, the Spark Conversations blog, and the Knowledge Exchange Network. To learn more about Children's Healthcare Canada, you can go to our website, follow us on Twitter or Facebook, or you can sign up for our weekly Spark newsletter at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca slash email, where you will learn about upcoming events, read the latest posts from our blog, and other exciting news and events from across the child and youth healthcare community. All right, hello everyone, and welcome to Children's Healthcare Canada's Spark Live webinar series. I'm Doug Maynard, your host for the next hour or so, and Spark Live is where we gather each Wednesday to showcase excellence and innovation from across the child and youth healthcare community to spark uh, conversation, ideas, and action. And uh, since we are live, I want to remind everyone, you do have the opportunity to ask questions, uh, at, and, and I encourage you to type those questions in at any time throughout the session. At any time you think of them, just type them in so that we have them ready uh, for our presenters when they're ready to take them. And also feel free to share your thoughts on Twitter at, at, at any time, and be sure to tag us at Child Health Can. And before we get to today's session, I do want to mention that this is the time of year where we think about uh, the Children's Healthcare Canada Annual Conference. Uh, this year, December 8th to, to the 10th uh, in Ottawa, here, here in Ottawa, where we are uh, at Children's Healthcare Canada, um, we are looking to welcome uh, some of our, our Spark Live audience that we see each week virtually. It'd be great to see it, lots of you in person. And if you go to conference.childrenshealthcarecanada, uh, you can see the program, you can register and all that sort of good stuff. So uh, hopefully we'll see lots of you in Ottawa. All right, so today's session is part of our election 2019 uh, getting Kids Back on the Radar series. Uh, so far in this series, this is a four-part series that we're doing just in, the, in relation to what, what we can do uh, around children's health issues in the context of, uh, of the federal election that is coming up in just a couple weeks. Uh, so far in the series, we've heard from our partners at the Canadian Pediatric Society, UNICEF Canada, and Children First Canada to get a sense of the, the breadth of child health issues that might be relevant in the context of a federal election. We're now doing a, a deeper dive uh, into some of the areas that Children's Healthcare Canada and our, and our members are specifically interested in. Last week, talking about issues related to appropriate regulations for pediatric medications and pediatric formulations, national pharmacare, and other issues related to safer medications for children. Today, we're talking about Indigenous health and pursuing reconciliation through Jordan's principle and data sovereignty. And, and just first off, in the interest of continuing this, this journey of reconciliation, we often talk about acknowledging the land of Indigenous peoples when we gather in person. And although we're not in person for this virtual gathering, I would still like to acknowledge that we at Children's Healthcare Canada are hosting this webinar uh, from the traditional and unceded territory of the Algonquin Nation. And I encourage each of you to acknowledge the, the history and Indigenous peoples of the land in which you are joining from, wherever you are, whether it be treaty or un unceded lands. And if you're from outside of Canada, I encourage you to acknowledge your own history with the Indigenous peoples from wherever, uh, wherever you're from. Uh, so with that, uh, uh, today we are talking about, as I mentioned, Jordan's Principle, which is a topic uh, familiar to many in the child and youth healthcare world. Uh, we're going to hear, we've heard lots of, about Jordan's Principle, and in, in, in particular from uh, Cindy Blackstock, Jennifer King, uh, from the First Nations uh, Child and Family Caring Society. Um, and uh, we're going to hear a little bit more today about where we're at now with, uh, with respect to Jordan's Principle and its implementation. Um, and we're also going to hear about daughter... Uh, data sovereignty uh, for Indigenous peoples and what that means for a healthcare and health research system that increasingly is trying to rely on data and evidence to inform practice and policy and how that uh, affects Indigenous uh, peoples and, and services for indig healthcare services for Indigenous people. So uh, with us today to talk about these issues, we have uh, Melissa Dane, who is uh, Anishinaabe Kwe from Northern Ontario, and Melissa is the research officer at the First Nations Informa Information Governance Centre 
And she's passionate about working uh, with and for Indigenous peoples, especially in terms of education and decolonization initiatives. And we also have Maria Santos uh, from the First Nations Information Governance Centre, and she's the First Nations Data Centre Program Manager uh, there. And Maria has a background in health informatics, community health and epidemiology and, and lots of other uh, uh, great information that she can bring in that area of data and informatics. And joining us first, though, uh, to talk about Jordan's principle, we're going to be talking. Uh, you're hearing from Mark St. Dennis, who works for the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada, and he speaks to with people of all ages and backgrounds of history and contemporary realities of co colonization in Canada, and the many ways we can all positively impact the lives of Indigenous children, youth, and their families. So it's my uh, pleasure to hand the virtual podium first off over to Mark St. Denis. Over to you. Uh, thank you very much. Um, so yes, as I was introduced, my name is Mark St. Dennis, and I work for the First Nations Child and Family Caring Society of Canada, or just the Caring Society for short. Uh, what we do is that we are a charitable organization that basically works for the well-being of First Nations children. Um, we do this in various ways. Sometimes it involves um, uh, pursuing legal avenues through the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, for example. Um, but the other part of, uh, of what we do is a lot of public education to teach people about the, the history and contemporary realities of colonization and how this has affected children. Um, today, specifically, I'm here to talk about uh, Jordan's Principle. I will provide a brief background of Jordan's Principle for those who may not know. And what this also entails is a quick, um, uh, I guess, uh, a little summary of uh, why Jordan's principle is needed through a an historical context, so I'll quickly go through that. Uh, I'm also going to talk about the current state of Canada's implementation of Jordan's principle, what this means for First Nations children and the service providers who are trying to help them, and what you can do during this federal election period to try and promote Jordan's principle and uh, well-being for Indigenous children. So, uh, like I was saying, to begin, I, I believe it's important to provide some historical context to um, understand why we need Jordan's principle. Uh, and so, the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, it called on people in Canada to learn from the past so that we can create a better future together. And there's definitely a link between um, where we came from to where we are today. and. Uh, what we have seen is that there is a very long-standing pattern in Canada where the government uh, definitely knows better. It has been, um, there's, there's just like, there's so much documentation, so many reports that show that Canada is definitely aware of the issues, but deliberately chooses not to do better. And so what we would like to see is um, uh, Canadians standing up for what they know is right and demanding that their politicians finally start uh, doing doing better for these kids. So I'm just going to uh, start with a quick timeline here and, and basically when Canada was founded 150 years ago as a country soon after the Indian Act was established as well as the residential school system and you'll see why I'm starting with the, the residential school system as I get a little bit further into my presentation. Um, however, uh, for those who don't know, I'm sure most of you do, is the residential schools were, were basically um, uh, places where children were forced to attend, where they weren't allowed to, um, you know, uh, participate in their culture, speak their languages, um, and uh, they were basically taken from their families and, and kept there. Uh, and so. Just to showcase the history of Canada being aware of what was happening, uh, we have the uh, 1907 Peter Henderson Bryce report. And so he was a medical doctor and uh, he was in charge of uh, basically at the time Canada's uh, health policy. And so he actually created a report based on uh, visiting some of the residential schools in Saskatchewan. And his report showed that the child deaths 
at that uh, particular school were more definitely preventable uh, and that uh, all that would be needed is uh, some interventions in order to to uh, fix those problems. And so he gave this report to the government of Canada and uh, the government um, essentially brushed it aside and decided not to do anything about it. And uh, Peter Henderson Bryce was eventually forced from office and uh, he, he was no longer able to um, act as a public servant in that, in that regard. So what he did instead is that he started um, telling the public about what he had learned. And so in 1922, he wrote a, a book called A National Crime. And this was published, and it was uh, it got pretty good coverage in terms of press, and and again, just sh showcasing that Canada was definitely aware of what was happening there. So the the, the cost actually to implement Dr. Peter Henderson's Bryce uh, reforms across the country was only ten thousand to fifteen thousand dollars. And uh, of course, I mean, at the time, that was with inflation, that would have that would have been uh, a considerable amount, but certainly not anything that was out of the ordinary. It's not not extraordinary. And 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 the reason that I kind of bring up the price is that the longer we wait to fix these issues, the the more it's going to cost. And uh, and and at the end of the day, uh, the price point really shouldn't matter when it comes to uh, children's well-being, and certainly when it comes to saving children's lives. And uh, there's there's definitely a lot of rhetoric at, we've noticed at the Caring Society coming from the government where they seem to be extremely concerned about the cost of these uh, um, reforms that we're, we're asking them to implement today. And uh, we certainly do not think that this is a reasonable consideration, especially when uh, studies have shown that every dollar you invest in the well-being of children are basically, uh, if you're looking at it from a purely economic standpoint, are repaid to society uh, at least three times the amount as those children grow up in a healthy environment and they're able to you know, pursue their dreams. And uh, so the cost is, is not something that, that we believe should be a consideration. So after, after the residential schools, and uh, we've all heard through the Truth and Reconciliation Commission the, um, you know, the atrocities and the terrible experiences and intergenerational trauma that has come from that. Um, after the residential school, when they, the last school closed in 1996, and in that interim period when schools were closing down, of course, there's also the 60s scoop, which has been uh, getting a lot of uh, attention in the media and more folks in Canada are becoming aware of this. Essentially, the 60s scoop was uh, the um, transformation of the residential school system where the idea was to remove children from their families, at, but instead of putting them in schools, now they're being put in um, foster care homes. And often these homes were not uh, with other Indigenous families, and often they're, they're far, far away from home communities. And there is even... Um, uh, Stories of children during the 60s scoop being bought um, and advertised almost as if they were uh, at a pet store, right? Um, and the thing is, we had the 60s scoop, but even today, we still have uh, a very um, huge problem with the child welfare system in Canada, whereby in some provinces, 80% of the children in the child welfare system are Indigenous. And this is all despite um, uh, just just volumes and volumes of of research and report often commissioned by the government itself, showing that uh, there's a massive overrepresentation of of uh, First Nations, Métis, and Inuit children in the child welfare system. So, for example, uh, many of you will have heard of the Royal Commission on Aboriginals, Aboriginal Peoples, which certainly pointed this out and offered recommendations in order to fix the system. And uh, unfortunately, the, the Royal Commission on Aboriginal Peoples and all of their recommendations were 
almost immediately put on the shelf and uh, not implemented. There was other studies such as the Joint National Policy Review, which looked at the child welfare system and had similar findings. And uh, once again, uh, Canada was aware of this report and decided not to do anything about it. And uh, even even the Caring Society, we ourselves, we participated with the government of Canada uh, to complete some, uh, I, I guess, like a full costing of the inequities in the child welfare system. These are called the Wanday reports. And that was about 10 years ago. And uh, again, this was something that we did with the government of Canada and they uh, didn't do anything about it. And so um, our executive director, Cindy Blackstock, she often talks about the Wanday reports as a bit of a eye-opening moment for her because she saw that... um, Participating in that type of research and that type of uh, of uh, report writing was part of the problem because, of course, this is so well documented. We don't really need to document it anymore. And what needs to be done is to is to uh, basically um, force the government to make the changes that are already on the books. And um, the the this is sort of the philosophy of of the caring society is that the Governments will not create change. Governments respond to change. And so what we need to do is encourage the public uh, to actually tell the government of Canada that, you know, enough is enough. We need to make a difference. And so that's where the public education comes in. But the other side of of that, uh, you know, that philosophy is that... um, we also took the government of Canada together with the Assembly of First Nations to the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. And um, basically, we, we alleged that uh, the government of Canada was discriminating against First Nations kids for failing to provide equi- equitable funding for child welfare for First Nations, but also for their failure to implement Jordan's principle. Uh, And again, this was about 10 years ago now when we first started the proceedings with the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal. And uh, in 2007, which was around the same time that we launched this um, this, uh, proceedings, the the government, uh, or I should say the House of Commons, unanimously supported Jordan's principle. So every single member of parliament who was sitting that day and across party lines, they unanimously supported Jordan's principle, which was basically to say that uh, First Nations kids must have the services they need when they need them. Uh, and uh, almost immediately, then the government started to um, narrow the definition of what Jordan's principle would would entail, and they uh, they basically made it so that there was not a single First Nations child in the entire country, who would be able to access funds through Jordan's principle. So after about uh, 10 years of back and forth with the the government of Canada at the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, um, the tribunal eventually found in 2016 that the Canadian government was in fact discriminating against First Nations kids on the basis of race, and national ethnic origins. And this is quite astonishing because um, this is Canada's own own human rights law that was used to determine that the Canadian state itself was discriminating against children in its own country. And so this is still uh, the state of things today because we have, of course, this decision in 2016, but the, the I guess, uh, compliance by the government of Canada is not at a state where the tribunal is satisfied with their response. And so the discrimination is ongoing. The child welfare system has not been reformed, and Jordan's principle has not been properly implemented. Of course, there has been progress, and I will uh, gladly give credit where credit is due to the government of Canada for the work that they have done. However, um, from our perspective at the Caring Society, uh, discrimination in any form 
is unacceptable. And so um, our minimum requirement is uh, 100% compliance with the tribunal orders because, of course, we measure change at the level of children. Does this affect children? Has the lives of children changed? And if the answer is no, if the answer is that these children are still having trouble accessing services, if the answer is that these children are still being discriminated against, then, of course, that is not good enough for us. Uh, we want to make sure that um, this is the last generation of First Nations kids who have to grow up in a world where they are treated uh, inequitably. So here, here we have um, a, uh, it's actually out of date now because there's an eighth non-compliance order from the Canadian Human Rights Tribunal, which I will, I will um, uh, describe in a, in a few slides. But this is a uh, infographic that we put together to try and help folks sort of see the path from when we filed the complaint to where we're at today. And there's just a, a few um, items that I want to highlight on this that are relevant to today's discussion, which is on Jordan's principle. And of course, the first is the decision, which I already mentioned, because it found that Canada was discriminating, um, not only for providing um, inequitable funds for child welfare, but also for not properly implementing Jordan's principle. And that was on January 26, 2016. But if we jump ahead to the third non-compliance order from the tribunal on May 26, 2017, this was basically when um, uh, the tribunal said to Canada, okay, we've, we've given you, you know, three orders so far saying that you have to implement Jordan's principle, but you haven't done that yet. And so they laid it out in very specific detail. Um, I think there was, there was something like... Uh, um, now, this is just my guess right now because I don't have it in front of me, but I, I believe there's at least 30 specific orders within that particular compliance order about how Canada was supposed to implement Jordan's principle, right down to communicating it um, to, to the public and um, just making sure that there was no wiggle room there. And then... Um, on, on the seventh non-compliance order, that last non-compliance order that you see at the bottom, you'll see that uh, basically very recently, this, is, this one came out where it was in February 21st, 2019, where there was an interim relief order for Jordan's principle that stated that non-status First Nations children in urgent situations, and what, um, what we mean by urgent is that they're in a situation where, uh, of course, it, it is a life and death situation, or where there is a um, clear indication that by ignoring the request, there will be uh, irremediable harm to the child, whether that is through physical or mental health. And, and so in situations like this where the child is non-status, uh, they will be covered under Jordan's principle. And uh, right now, the tribunal has, um, I guess, uh, it's considering an additional order on um, the definition of First Nations. And so that, that's, that's going to be something that's upcoming and certainly something that um, we're going to be keeping our eye on. So just a, another a quick background on Jordan's Principle, because we can't really talk about Jordan's Principle without talking about Jordan River Anderson. And here you'll also see the connection between the child welfare system and Jordan's Principle. And so Jordan River Anderson was a young boy from Norway House Cree Nation, and um, he was hospitalized with um, severe medical problems. And uh, while he was in the hospital, the government of Canada and the, uh, the government of Manitoba were arguing about who would pay for his care. Now, uh, he was cleared to leave the hospital, so he could go live in a family home. Now, a lot of people don't realize is that uh, the, he wasn't cleared to go live in his family home, back home in Norway House Cree Nation, because the only way that he could receive the medical, out of, out of hospital medical care he needed was to be put in the child welfare system. And so this is actually a thing that a lot of First Nations parents are faced with today, in that in order to receive 
services for their child that any other child would receive as a matter of course. Um, but because they're First Nations, the only way to receive that service is actually to um, put their child in the child welfare system voluntarily. And so this is what would have had to have happened with Jordan. He w would have had to have been put into a, a foster care home near the hospital in Winnipeg. However, that never happened because of that arguing between the governments. And Jordan passed away in hospital. He spent his entire life in the hospital. And so Jordan's principle was created by his family and uh, given to the Caring Society to be the stewards of uh, in honor of his story. And basically, the principle is very simple, and it states that all First Nations kids on or off reserve must receive the public services they need when they need them. So just some, some key elements of Jordan's principle uh, is that, <clears throat> of course, as I mentioned, Canada's previous definitions were too narrow and discriminatory. And so that's why in the 2017 decision from the tribunal, they made a very specific definition that Canada must follow. And Canada has adopted that definition. Whether, but However, as I will outline, there is definitely some problems with the implementation of that definition. And in fact, Canada's uh, earlier non-compliance, and the tribunal has noted this to Jordan's principle, has d been directly linked to at least the deaths of two young girls uh, who were not able to receive the, the mental health services that they needed, and so they ended up committing suicide. And this is a, of course, tragic, and the entire point of Jordan's principle is to help kids so that they, they never are in the situation where they have to feel like they must make that decision. And uh, the, the suicide crisis is still an ongoing issue. And this is why it's so important that Jordan's principle is implemented properly. Not just 50% not just, uh, implementation, but 100% implementation because it is not acceptable that any child would ever, ever you know, um, be to the point where suicide is an option for them. They, they need to receive the services they need exactly when they need them, and the governments can't be arguing about um, price or whether or not um, a child, uh, you know, is uh, eligible, etc. And of course, uh, Jordan's principle applies to all First Nations children, whether they are resident on or off reserve. So a lot of the times, um, things are for First Nations only on reserve, but it's important that we're also talking about um, off-reserve children. And it applies to all public services. So this is um, including health care, which uh, I believe a lot, of you, a lot of you listening today are health care providers, but it also uh, is, is about um, education and uh, pretty much any service you can possibly think of. And substantive equality applies. What this means is that um, we have to keep in mind when looking at Jordan's principle that there is a history of colonization, as we talked about earlier. And so there is such things as intergenerational trauma. And the fact that uh, First Nations children, because their families in the history, they actually have significantly more barriers that they have to overcome that other children do not face. And so um, when looking at Jordan's principle, the government is actually supposed to look at that history, and if they have to provide a service that is not ordinarily provided to other children, that can happen under Jordan's principle. Um, and of course, uh, the, the federal government, when, when putting forward a, a case, has 48 hours to respond to uh, non-urgent cases and 12 hours to respond to urgent cases. And then uh, the other important piece that, uh, especially for uh, service providers, is that the government of Canada cannot uh, engage in what's called case conferencing. So essentially, if you are the service provider that is working with that First Nations child or that family, and, uh, and you have recommended a treatment plan, that is the treatment plan that the government of Canada has to consider. Because previously what they have done is that uh, they have completely ignored the advice of the service providers that are working directly with the families, and they have sought their own third-party um, advice from 
from professionals who are not actually affiliated with the family at all. And so what this says in the late, in the ruling from 2017 is that um, if there is already professionals involved with the case and they have already recommended a particular um, procedure or a particular treatment plan, then that is the treatment plan that Canada has to look at. So some of the problems that we have encountered, and, and this is where um, we really need uh, help from the general public, because of course we are going to Canada telling them about the problems that we see on uh, a day-to-day -day basis, uh, and, but we also need uh, folks from service providers and, and the general public to be going to the Member of Parliament, um, going to the political parties, asking why the implementation isn't 100%. So just some examples of the things we're seeing today is that, uh, for, one, for one, is that uh, Canada is not consistently applying this idea of substantive equality. So they're not uh, consistently considering the fact that there are more barriers to First Nations children than there are uh, non-Indigenous children in Canada. Um, oftentimes, we will um, learn of denials for Jordan's principal requests uh, that where Canada says this is a service that's not ordinarily provided to First Nations kids, um, which, according to the legal definition of Jordan's principle through the tribunal, is not a relevant consideration. And the other thing is that we've also seen Canada consistently telling parents that they have to prove that substantive equality applies, whereas from our perspective, we believe that the government of Canada is the one that has to, to prove that substantive equality does not apply because we think it should be uh, a given that substantive equality applies in the vast majority of cases. We've also seen where information requests are causing delays. So that's where the government of Canada is coming to the service provider or the family and asking for a lot of um, various um, letters of support or extra information and is causing significant delays as well as just delays in general. I mentioned earlier that the federal government has 48 hours to respond to most cases. Sometimes this can take months. And of course, uh, when, we're, when we're talking about the timeline for a child, a month is a long time, especially when they're waiting for a service. There's also a lack of procedure for responding to urgent cases. So these are the cases where it's life-threatening or it could cause a major harm in the child's life. Where, um, for example, um, over the weekend. So the government is supposed to respond to cases within 12 hours that are urgent, but over the weekend, uh, people may not re receive a response at all. And so they're waiting for more than 48 hours for an urgent case. And as I mentioned, we've also seen the government overriding or questioning professional treatment plans. Also, reimbursement schedules taking too long. Or um, one of the things that we have, have, have definitely encountered is that maternal health and prenatal care are not being covered by Jordan's principle. However, from our perspective uh, and from First Nations' perspective of holistic, lifelong um, understanding of, of, you know, child health, we definitely think maternal health and prenatal care should apply. So here is a um, document that is about, uh, I'm, I think it's about 30 pages long. It's uh, basically, uh, this is a document that, for some reason, the link I had up on here is not showing, uh, but if you if you want, you can uh, email me directly at mstdennis at fncaringsociety.com or just our info box at info at fncaringsociety.com and we can link you to this document that uh, outlines our concerns basically in entirety about uh, the CHRT orders on Jordan's principles specifically and Canada's compliance with them. So here, here's another infographic that we have on our website at jordansprinciple.ca. Um, I won't go through this one, but I just want to draw your attention as service providers, anyone can make a referral to Jordan's principle on behalf of a First Nations child and working with the First Nations parents or caregivers. And so I just want to draw your attention to those two numbers. There are 24-hour call centers that uh, you can call and to make a referral for a case. And like I said, this can be something that is medically related or education or uh, 
housing, anything that is a public service or could conceive to be a public service can be accessed through Jordan's principal. And so uh, here is something that we can do with um, the federal election that is uh, coming up right now. So you may have heard that just very, very recently, um, last, uh, last month, so September 9th, there was a tribunal order that came down that was about compensation for First Nations kids. Now, this was largely related to compensation for um, children in the child welfare system. And the tribunal has said that they're going to um, award uh, $40,000, the maximum that, that can be given as compensation under the Canadian Human Rights Act, to um, First Nations children who are in the child welfare system. However, uh, in relation to Jordan's principle, the, the tribunal also said that each First Nations child on or off reserve who was not removed from their family home but was either denied services covered under Jordan's principle, as defined in the 2017 order that I spoke about earlier, or who received such services but only after an unreasonable delay or upon reconsideration ordered by the tribunal, um, is potentially eligible to receive that $40,000 of compensation. In addition, each parent or grandparent of that child who was uh, denied services covered under Jordan's principle, or they received the services but only after an unreasonable delay or reconsideration ordered by the tribunal, the parent or grandparent is also eligible for $40,000. And so this is, again, the maximum compensation that is available under the Canadian Human Rights Act. And of course, it doesn't uh, fix the problem, but it definitely um, is is helpful. And one of the so right now this came down in September uh, 9th, and the Canadian government has 30 days to respond, saying whether or not they're going to appeal that decision or not. And unless they did so this morning, which I'm unaware of, uh, at this point, the, the Canadian government has not said that they're going to appeal. However, they, I believe they have until about uh, Monday of next week. And so what we're asking folks to do is to talk to uh, their local candidates and, and ask if uh, the candidate themselves and if the um, uh, party that they represent or that they're part of will uh, support the latest ruling. Um, I believe that the, the NDP and the Greens have said that they will. So far, the Liberals and the Conservatives have not mentioned anything about it. And uh, I'm not sure if anyone has asked anyone from the Bloc Québécois or uh, the People's Party of Canada. Um, so we're, we're, we're definitely interested and we want to make this an election issue um, that this is something that the whichever government, whichever party forms government uh, the next, uh, in the, the next few months, that uh, they will support and not fight these children um, for what really should is just the, the bare minimum of, um, you know, uh, making amends for the racial discrimination that the government uh, has uh, enacted against children for so long. And of course, the other thing we have here is the Spirit Bear Plan, which is uh, our, our main policy put together by First Nations and fully endorsed by many First Nations organizations, including the Assembly of First Nations, the Chiefs of Ontario, and, and others, uh, that is essentially calling on the Government of Canada to uh, fully implement all of the tribunal orders, as well as, uh, as, well as um, calling on Parliament to publicly cost out all of the inequities in public services to First Nations children and propose solutions to fix it. And uh, right now, um, I mean, this is, a, again, you can look at this in more detail on our website at fncaringsociety.com. And um, this, is, this is essentially, uh, we're asking folks to call their MPs to, to support this. And uh, right now, we have not heard anything back, even though it's unanimously supported by First Nations across the country. 
So if, if you have any questions or you'd like to learn more, you can, of course, visit us at our website, fncaringsociety.com, as well as uh, all of our social media. Uh, you can get in touch with us there, and it's all listed on the screen. Uh, so thank you so much, and uh, I'm looking forward to receiving any questions you may have. Thank you, Mark. Uh, it's unbelievable that we're still having this conversation. I, we had Cindy Blackstock came to our conference more than 10 years ago to talk about this, much more than 10 years ago, and we're still having this conversation, so, and, which is really quite unbelievable. But it's great that you guys are continuing to... Uh, to, carry, to, to, to push this issue, uh, we, like you said, there has been some success, but still a long way to go. And this is a great opportunity uh, to talk to your candidates, uh, to go to the website, use those resources that they have there when you're talking to the candidate, potential candidates at uh, this election, and uh, see if there's anything that uh, you can do locally to, uh, to help support the First Nations, uh, or to, to support First Nations children everywhere. Um, so with that, we're going to move on to the First Nations Information Governance Center. We're going to hear from Melissa and uh, Maria to talk about data sovereignty and other data-related issues uh, for First Nations people. So over to, uh, to Maria and Melissa. Okay. So thank you, Children's Healthcare Canada, for inviting us to speak today. Um, and thank you, Mark, uh, and the Caring Society for that insightful presentation. Uh, which now leads us to the topic of First Nations data sovereignty. Um, so I am just going to um, uh, quickly, uh, this is just a brief overview of what we plan to discuss today at our presentation. Um, and I'm just... So FNIGC uh, is an incorporated nonprofit organization it's governed by a board of directors appointed by each of the uh, 10 First Nations regional member organizations across Canada. And um, along with these regional member organizations, uh, we administer national First Nations surveys, but also conduct work on research and planning to training. Our vision, our vision is, um, we envision that every First Nation will achieve data sovereignty in alignment with its distinct worldview. And, in, and how we plan to do this is with First Nations uh, by asserting data sovereignty and supporting the development of information governance and management at the community level. And that would be done through regional and national partnerships. We adhere to free prior and informed consent, respect nation to nation relationships and recognize the distinct customs of nations. So I'll just hand it over to Melissa, who will talk about sovereignty. Okay, so if we're going to fully appreciate everything we're discussing here today, I think it's really important that we define two key terms. The first is sovereignty, and uh, this is a word that you might be familiar with, maybe not, um, but I just want to make sure everyone's on the same page. So first, what does sovereignty mean? Now, uh, the Cambridge English Dictionary defines sovereignty as the power of a country to control its own government. In essence, the ability to make decisions uh, about your people and for your people is a di distinct power, a sovereign nation. Uh, this is key when we're talking about First Nations rights and sovereignty because First Nations are their own nations. They're their own governments and they have the ability to make decisions for their people. Now, uh, some of you might be asking, well, how are First Nations sovereign nations if they reside in Canada? And that's a great question. First Nations and the Canadian government have a long history of treaties and legislation and engagements that all speak to First Nations rights and power as sovereign government entities. Um, given our time constraint today, I'll briefly go over a few of those big pieces uh, here on the next slide. So since contact, settlers and First Nations have established agreements between them. So nation to nation agreements and treaties, many of which uh, are still standing today. One of the earliest examples I can speak to is the Truro Wampum Treaty that was signed between the Dutch and Haudenosaunee in 1613. It's also the wampum belt that you're seeing in the image on the left. And this agreement, uh, allowed each nation to live off the same lands in peace and friendship and with respect to one another. And the agreement specifically indicates that neither was meant to interfere with the affairs or life of the other, explicitly referencing the sovereignty not only of the Dutch, but of the Haudenosaunee as well. 
Another example of First Nations sovereignty, we can look to the Royal Proclamation that was signed in 1763 uh, by King George III. This came right after the British won the Seven Years' War, and it dictated a British legal procedure for acquiring land in the new Canadian colony, uh, meaning that British citizens or the British state would have to enter into treaty agreements with the First Nations to go about acquiring their land and specifically recognizes that First Nations are the title holders to their lands and have the rights to control what happens um, in them until it was ceded over by treaty. Uh, further treaties were signed throughout Canadian history, uh, treaties like the Treaty of Niagara, the James Bay Treaties, the Jay Treaties, as well as other legislation like the Indian Act, which outlines rights and sovereignty of First Nations in Canada. All of these agreements and pieces of legislation are still active in some way today, and each of them speak to the sovereignty and authority First Nations have over their people, their economies, and their lands. Now, we talked about the first term, so now that we know that what sovereignty is, um, and better understand that First Nations are sovereign nations, uh, it's time to define our second term. So that is data sovereignty. Now, if sovereignty means having the power to control your own government, data sovereignty is the power to control your own data. Now, that kind of control can be exerted in many ways. So to give you um, some idea of the extent of data sovereignty, I've broken some of the main elements down for you. So sovereign nations, First Nations, have the right, inherent or constitutionally protected, to exercise authority over their education, their laws, their policies, health, information, and that includes their data and um, other forms of information. First Nations rights transcend uh, reserve boundaries, the Indian Act and government policy. So this is something that's always in place. And integral to these concepts, uh, or integral to these rights are the concepts of data sovereignty and information government. So again, having that power to control their information and their data. Now, uh, you might be wondering, why are we talking about history and sovereignty in terms of the OCAP principles that we'll be talking about and the FNIGC? Well, the big reason is that most of those treaties and agreements that we talked about earlier, while well, they're still standing, they haven't been fully upheld and the rights of First Nations have frequently been diminished, um, which infringes on First Nations sovereignty, including and but most especially First Nations sovereignty over its data. So today, the Canadian government have worked to uncover some of the injustices uh, First Nations people have experienced and bring that to light in a broader stage. Um, Mark already discussed the establishment of the Truth and Reconciliation Commission, uh, and they issued a report in 2015 citing the 94 calls to actions, which I'm sure many of you are familiar with, uh, that the government needs to uphold and establish an effort to bring truth forward and reconcile with Indigenous peoples in Canada. The TRC was originally formed to detail the tragic and long-lasting effects of Indian residential schools, which we discussed earlier throughout Canada, and collected testimony from survivors of the RIS system, or IRS system. Canada also signed the United Nations Declarations on the Right of Indigenous Peoples, or UNDRIP, and this declaration speaks to the global mistreatment of Indigenous peoples and speaks to their inherent rights within the signatory nations as First Peoples, which includes Canada. Uh, both the TRC calls to actions and UNDRIP speak to sovereignty of First Nations and their ability to control and govern their own people and their own nation. So this is something that's definitely in primary focus today. Uh, because of Canada's long history of infringing upon First Nations sovereignty, uh, it's especially important to establish new protocols and new procedures within First Nations and within Canadian institutions as well to better protect the rights of First Nations. Uh, one do way of doing that is re-establishing and protecting First Nations data sovereignty. Now, how exactly do we go about doing that and what does that look like in the Canadian context today? Well, for us here at FNIGC, the answer to that question lies in the principles of OCAP. So the principles of OCAP are a way uh, to acknowledge and respect the right of self-determination of First Nations, including um, having the jurisdiction and authority to make decisions about research in their communities and how data is used. Um, they're meant to guide First Nations in the issues of data sovereignty and data governance on a nation-to-nation -nation basis. So what 
fits for one nation or one community might not fit for the other. And it is meant to be flexible in that way. And each of the letters stand for one of the key principal um, concepts integral to OCAP. So the first letter, you can see it up on the screen, is O, and it stands for ownership. So this principle is meant to express that First Nations have collective ownership over their information and data, an inherent ownership over it. This can mean health data, biological matter, community information, but also traditional and sacred knowledge as well. Uh, the second letter is C, which stands for control. And control is meant to refer to First Nations having full control over their information, including how it's collected, how it's stored, analyzed, used, interpreted, and even disseminated. First Nations have the right to control anything that impacts them or their data. The third letter is A, which is a two, and it stands for access, and it's a twofold principle. So first, First Nations need to have access to their own data. A lot of First Nations data is being housed by other third parties or other government entities, um, the Canadian government being a huge source of that in particular. Uh, but they also need to have act control over who else can access said data. So developing and governing over data access protocols would be key here. And then the last principle is P for possession. So it's just like what it sounds like, uh, making sure First Nations possess their data, and that could be physically, digitally, or both. Uh, but possession is integral to OCAP because it's the easiest way for First Nations to assert their sovereignty, um, or better yet, have uh, full control over ownership, control, and access over their data. So why is OCAP and data sovereignty so why is OCAP and data sovereignty important? OCAP not only establishes First Nations sovereignty over their information, but goes about it in a way that is reflective of their First Nations worldviews and priorities. Uh, so uh, not a full colonial system. It also allows First Nations to establish jurisdiction over their own data, which allows communities to provide direction on how information can be used to benefit their community in a manner that mitigates harm. So instead, First Nations are able to determine their own distinct directions and where they want to go that are focused on community well-being and what exactly that means to them. What does community well-being mean to each First Nation? Uh, collected information by First Nations has the power to change lives by influencing evidence-based decision-making. And that leads to better policies and programming for their communities and for their people. It also allows them to advocate for their communities and makes them better equipped to confront social injustices, um, much of which we discussed in that earlier presentation, or was discussed in the earlier presentation. Okay, so now that we have established uh, that data can identify priorities and set strategic goals and support community planning, um, but it's important to note that many First Nations uh, have already experienced or have a long history experiencing community data being used for other purposes that are not in their best interests or benefit or research um, harming the community in some way. Now on the screen you can see a list of uh, different types of harm that could happen from uh, research studies uh, being used for anyone but in particularly in this context, First Nations have a long history of legal harm, relationship harm, economic, physical, social, and psychological harm stemming from unethical studies. One example we have of that is uh, the bad blood studies, like uh, we like to call them. And that happened between 1982 and 1985. Uh, basically, Health Canada funded this study uh, with the New Chalmers people, um, to study arthritis in the community. And uh, Dr. Richard Ward uh, from UBC took 883 vials from the uh, blood from the community to study uh, arthritis in the community. But he ended up moving to the University of Utah in uh, 1986, and then he ended up at Oxford University, and he took that blood with him. And then he kept on using the blood for different areas of research, including HIV and AIDS studies and population genetics. Uh, without consent from the community. And of course, he kept on publishing and um, furthered his own academic career off of these vials of blood. He even went on to publish a story, uh, publish papers on his theory uh, of migration across the Bering Strait, which he used the blood to support those claims, which entirely disrespected and undermined the New Chalmers 
uh, traditional beliefs about creation, and it was something they didn't consent to. Now, we were talking about residential schools in the 60s scoop year earlier, and data has a big part on how those came about. So the government was able to use data collected about First Nations children in order to find those children and collect them and take them to school or take them out of the systems. And they had uh, that data available because parents had shared information with government agents through registry programs or legal involvement or any of the uh, course of daily life things that you have to fill in that um, would end up being data. And as a result of this deep and communal personal loss, uh, there's a mistrust in the system that resulted in withdrawal from sharing personal information and engagement in do uh, government systems. So uh, intentionally taking your data out. Now, one specific study that I can talk to you that happened during the era of residential schools are nutritional studies that were funded by the Department of Indian Affairs Canada. And they happened uh, with six different residential schools between 1942 and 1952. And they uh, were studying nutrition in children and uh, the harms of undernutrition. And Dr. Percy Moore, who is the branch superintendent of medical services at Indian Affairs Canada, and then Dr. Frederick Tisdale, who's a pediatrician nutritionist from SickKids in Toronto, uh, they uh, pioneered these studies. And during that time, it was very uh, common for the Indigenous children involved to be denied food, to be denied their dental care or other medications they needed to be on, under the guise of not wanting to skew the results of the study. And in one experiment particularly that they ran, they found, uh, children were given a mix, a flour mix containing thiamine, riboflavin, niacin, and bone meal. And they actually found, it, uh, found out that this concoction uh, increased rates of anemia and most likely led to higher uh, death rates at these schools. But even after the first study um, went poorly, the study was replicated in all of the other schools despite the negative results. So I'll pass you off to Maria to finish up. I just want to do a time check here. Uh, Doug, how are we with regards? <laughs> we, uh, we we are a little bit behind. We, we may not have as much time to take questions, but please take take the time you need to, to finish uh, your presentation. We, the, the presentation is recorded just for those in the audience. If you do have to leave, the recording will be available if you need to leave and come back to the recording to catch the ending or anything else you might have missed. So, so go ahead and finish uh, whatever it is you need to finish, Maria. Okay, that sounds great. So uh, in their 2017 paper, uh, Decolonizing Data, Indigenous Data Sovereignty Primer, the BC First Nations Data Governance Initiative identified how Indigenous data has traditionally been handled and managed by Canada. So the methods and approaches used to gather, analyze, and share data on Indigenous communities um, we have seen has led to countless laws, policies, and programs which were created under the Western worldviews that are culturally distorted, discriminatory, oppressive, and harmful to First Nations. Data on Indigenous communities have typically been collected and interpreted through a lens, lens of inherent lack, uh, with focus on statistics that reflect disadvantage and negative stereotyping. It doesn't consider how an Indigenous person would interpret the information, but rather a Western approach. Data on Indigenous communities have been of little use to Indigenous communities. The collection of data on Indigenous people is viewed as primarily servicing government requirements rather than supporting Indigenous people's development agendas. So there are several data sources and, uh, on Indigenous people, and these data sources are often provide a fragmented and incomplete picture of the realities of Indigenous people in Canada. Accessing current quality data on First Nations peoples remain a complex issue with numerous challenges and considerations due to the variability in the collection and reporting of the data and the variation in the kind of information collected regionally and nationally. It's difficult to access accurate, reliable, useful and comparable data regarding First Nations people. Lastly, data on Indigenous communities collected by the nation state government has been assumed to be owned and therefore controlled by said government and without a meaningful nation to nation dialogue about data sovereignty. Many First Nations experience arduous reporting requirements with regard to federal funding. However, the data collected aren't being effectively analyzed and used to advance the well being of First Nations. 
data created and used to administer the Indian Act and federal programs are federal data. So though often collected by furnace nations, they support federal programs. Furthermore, their quality isn't high. And as successive reports of the Auditor General of Canada have pointed out, the relevance of these data to communities is often not clear. Multiple reports are filed, but correspond little to community plans or priorities. So without First Nations involvement in the development and use of the data, communities have become resistant to sharing their information due to the mistrust of the data collection process. Without their participation, the, over quality, the overall quality of the data is questionable. And as, Ms. as Melissa earlier described, this resistance is a result of a history of exploitation and misuse of data and research in First Nations. Building trusting relationships when doing research involves First Nations, involving First Nations is fundamental to its success and legitimacy because when communities don't trust the organizations collecting the data or the data collectors themselves and are not interest, invested in the purpose of the data, it becomes really difficult to garner their participation. So as previously indicated, data on Indigenous communities has typically been collected and interpreted through a deficit lens. This negative framing can facilitate discouragement and self-fulfilling prophecies for, this, for, the, for the group represented in the statistic and contribute to maintaining the socioeconomic, socioeconomic gap between First Nations and Canadian populations. Communities and nations want to tell their own stories in their own words. So it's important to focus on factors that promote wellness and healthy living, such as resiliency, language and culture, balance in the four areas of physical, mental, emotional, and spiritual. Collection of data should be community-driven, distinctions-based, culturally relevant, compliant with OCAP principles, and collected from the grassroots up. It's also important to consider environmental con indicators when collecting and monitoring data on community impacts, such as state of community facilities, air, water, food systems, wildlife, ecosystems, and climate change. Lastly, it's also important to develop nation-to-nation -nation relationship indicators, measuring consultation, accommodation, and consent, and whether government partners are living up to the commitments. Indicators which already exist in elders' traditional stories, First Nations language, and tra traditional knowledge systems can shift the focus from illness to wellness. First Nations have a deep connection to their information, knowledge, and data, particularly traditional or sacred knowledge, teachings, and ceremonial practices that have been passed down from many generations to the next. So First Nations data sovereignty is the cornerstone to nation building. In 2016 and 2018, the AFN Chiefs and Assembly sought federal government funding and support to develop fully functional regional information governance centers, RIGCs, across Canada, as well as to coordinate a national First Nations data governance strategy. RIGCs are First Nations led regionally based data stewards and advisory centers that can support the information governance needs of First Nations governments and their service organizations in a way that enables them to realize their right to self-determination. FNIGC works closely with its 10 regional survey de delivery partners. Each region is unique and at a different stage of development, but all 10 regions will be engaged in developing a, na a national data governance strategy. The strategy will determine in part how the RIGCs will come together to do national level work while respecting that the visions and goals of First Nations can vary by community and region. RIGCs will assist First Nations in collecting, holding, managing, and using their data in ways that will help them inform and drive their self-determination. They will help communities realize their own power to decide about data and information and to exercise the same sovereignty that other governments take for granted, rather than just being administrators collecting data on behalf of the government funder. RIGCs will also support the data and research needs of First Nations regional service and political organizations in addition to First Nations communities. Eventually, 
the RIGCs will be poised to help the federal government measure progress on its commitments to support a transformed relationship with First Nations, specifically the implementation of UNDRIP and the calls to action of the TRC, the development of a new fiscal relationship with First Nations featuring predictability, sufficiency, and mutual accountability, a reduction in the reporting burden, and the rebuilding of First Nations institutions and capacity. Consequently, there will be need for significant First Nations-led work to establish relevant culturally-based indicators and to gather and share national level statistics. Only such work can allow measurement of progress towards these stated goals. Measuring progress will require Canada to enter into respectful information sharing relationships with First Nations and regional organizations can help mediate such relationships as well as contribute to their data, insights and perspectives to national statistics gathering processes led by the FNIGC. So um, it, it, with regards to time here, uh, this, these are just some uh, examples of where data governance um, is in action currently. Um, and it includes not just our own initiatives, but those of our regional member organizations. Um, I guess what I'll just do is I'll highlight um, some of these and not all, for specifically the Tawikan partnership. Um, through carefully managed and legally stringent partnerships with district health authorities, the Nova Scotia Department of Health and Wellness, Health Canada, and D Dalhousie University, the Tweakin partners, partners, which consist of five Cape Breton First Nations, have been able to leverage external health information management resources while retaining ownership, control, and access over their community's health data. So this collective community data has been an effective tool in improving community health services and policy. Another example is the British Columbia First Nations Data Governance Initiative, which supports 13 BC First Nations communities um, as First Nations demonstration sites. And these demo sites uh, will deploy a suite of locally developed First Nations program administration and data collection systems across their First Nations and provide advice to the coordination team on the development of data and information management standards and in the design of relevant community reports. Uh, we've also have other examples uh, such as um, the Alberta First Nations Information Governance Center that is um, working with their um, communities to develop community profile reports uh, based on um, uh, data that uh, uh, these communities cannot access. And then lastly, the Chiefs of Ontario uh, and the Institute for Clinical Evaluative Sciences um, have entered into agreement where they have also carried out health-related analyses uh, for KU and uh, their First Nations communities. So in order to accomplish this, uh, establishing and maintaining respectful relationships with provincial health services, governments, institutions, researchers, and others have to be based on the principles of OCAP. Um, and by improving collaboration, uh, improved collaboration is needed at multiple levels. And, um, and these relationships should be based on equity, trust, and balance. And that First Nations should be cautious of those who seek exploitive partnerships with First Nations. So OCAP was developed by First Nations leadership and knowledge holders over 20 years ago. Um, it's not just one recipe, but a vision that grows as we grow in experience and shared know-how. So at the most recent uh, First Nations Data Governance Strategy Summit last February, uh, participants talked about an OCAP version two. And so data sovereignty is, re is referred to as the, the new OCAP. And at the summit, it, this was an opportunity to discuss why and how uh, this work needed to be shared and unified. Um, while promoting data sovereignty for each First Nation and driving the progress at a national level. First Nations should be in control of their own information by embracing a with us, for us, by us way of thinking. And 
who is at the center. The whole thinking of a national strategy must include the individual, family, community, and tribal or regional levels. When activity is done at a national level, it must be based on who it will benefit. Is it the individual or the community? To guide the strategy, the principles must always align with a collective vision in mind, ensuring wellness for generations to come and must be explored in an ethical space. And um, as Mindy uh, Denny, who is uh, one of our BIRD members, has quoted, the strategy should always um, include ways to close the gap by comparing with other standards. So she has said that the gaps First Nations should seek to close should focus on how far we are away from the lives the Creator intended us to live. So establishing a framework for unique RIGCs is going to be a central pillar um, for this strategy and it's just, it's deemed fundamental for achieving collective success. So I'm not going to go over these. Um, simply this is more of a, is a summary of uh, the presentation. Um, it, these are 10 principles that uh, the BC First Nations Data Governance Initiative and Open North um, had come up with when they developed a primer to discuss Indigenous data sovereignty. And um, the, this primer was to offer the Government of Canada a tool to better understand the definition of data sovereignty as it applies to Indigenous realities, um, as well as to outline the basic principles and values of Indigenous data sovereignties necessary um, in order to have that skillful nation-to-nation -nation dialogue regarding this issue. And then lastly, that primer was also used to highlight the urgency of this issue and the unique opportunities it presents. And then these are the, um, the five driving values for data sovereignty, um, which have, I, throughout the presentation have been, have been covered. Um, so in conclusion, um, by building information governance capacity, enacting First Nations laws, entering into data sharing and license to use contracts, creating regional data centers and repatriating our data, First Nations are get, will get closer to exercising full jurisdiction over their information. As First Nations realize their own capacity to govern and use their information, the federal practice of governing data on Indians can give way to a nation-based approach. By supporting data governance within First Nations, the federal government will enhance its ability to base its reporting on sound planning informed by solid evidence. So that's all for our presentation. This is um, uh, our email addresses uh, on, in case you have any uh, questions that you'd like to send to us. And then that's just a, um, uh, to promote our uh, OCAP um, training course. Uh, which is uh, on, provided online in collaboration with Algonquin College. And that can be accessed at our website. So back to you. All right. Thank you very much, Maria and Melissa. Um, <clears throat> as you've all noticed, we are a little bit over time. We won't have too much time for uh, for questions, unfortunately. Uh, I did quickly just want to mention, just in the in, in the, the, the the context of this this webinar being part of our election sort of our election 2019 series, um, just to help support. Uh, I think Mark did a great job of sort of identifying the opportunity to bring these issues to uh, constituent uh, to candidates as as we're approaching this election. If you do have the opportunity to speak them. To to them at your door, at your hospital, or wherever you are. Uh, he had some great resources uh, on their website at FN Caring Society uh, dot, uh, dot com, uh, and uh, as well Maria and Melissa FNIGC dot CA. It's a great uh, resources there. But Children's Healthcare Canada at uh, Children's Healthcare Canada dot CA slash election dash twenty nineteen. We have some resources that will help uh, support your activities. Uh, a bit of background on what our issue, what the what we feel some of the issues are that are relevant to the child and youth health care uh, community. Uh, how to get involved. There's uh, some information there about things you can do to connect with the potential candidates. Um, 
Uh, we also have a social media toolkit, which uh, if you're like me and you don't ever know what to put in your social media posts like on Twitter or Facebook, we've got some pre-written tweets and Facebook posts with images and that sort of thing that you are welcome to just copy and send out. And then, of course, we have this advocacy webinar series that uh, we're, uh, that this was part three of four. We have a part four coming up next week. So if you want to go check out our resources on our website. So I just wanted to go back to, uh, before we sign off, just back to uh, Mark and Melissa and and uh, Maria, just for uh, just any closing messages you want to leave the audience with before we sign off. Mark, we'll start with you. Uh, sure, yeah. Well, I just want to quickly thank everyone for attending today and, and listening to what I had to say. And uh, I'm just hoping that, um, you know, we can um, all take the opportunity to, to learn a bit more about what is happening and, and uh, you know, so that we can work together to make uh, the lives of First Nations kids in this country um, as they should be, which is uh, happy, healthy, and proud of who they are. All right. Thank you very much, Mark. And if people want to get in touch with you, uh, you said it, what, your email address was mstdennis at uh, fncaringsociety.com. Is that correct? That's correct. And uh, you can find my email address on our website as well, which uh, fncaringsociety.com. All right, that's great. And uh, Maria, Melissa, uh, any closing messages from you? Um, I guess uh, essentially the, the the important thing here was for us it was to communicate um, the reason why First Nations data sovereignty is required here um, in Canada, and by supporting um, data governance within First Nations. Um, First Nations will have better control um, um, with regards to being able to improve the well-being of their of their communities um, themselves, as well as um, and it, which includes children um, as well as adults and, and and elders and themselves. Thank you very yeah, much. And yeah. the best the best place for people to get in touch with you, fnigc.ca is your website. Uh, is there any anywhere else you, that people should go to get more information about this or just straight to the website is probably the best place? Yeah, that's correct. We have um, many resources and reports that are available there um, as well. Um, we uh, they, People are welcome to contact us as well um, directly. All right. Email. Sounds, we, sounds we good. Have all right, sounds good. Thank you very much. Th thank you to, to both uh, you, uh, Melissa Dane and uh, Maria Santos, as well as you, uh, Mark St. Dennis. Great presentation. These are like th these are Jordan's principle, an issue we've been talking about for years, and still a long way to go. Data sovereignty, I think, a fairly new issue for a lot of people. Uh, it, 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 not knowing a lot about this, we really appreciate sort of the introduction to these principles, and we look uh, forward to to learning more. Maybe over the coming months, maybe we'll have some of you back uh, to sort of take us to, to, to the next phase on, on how we can work uh, together uh, as the, 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 the national healthcare system working with indigenous communities around these issues. So, um, so thanks again for everyone for coming today. Uh, and we certainly wish you the best of luck as you engage with your candidates in your area and push these issues. And don't hesitate to let us know what we can do here at Children's Healthcare Canada to help out. Uh, as most of you know, we do our, our webinars every Wednesday at 11 a.m. Eastern time, and we do record the session. So anyone who did have to leave, you will have the opportunity Opportunity to come back and listen to the uh, end of, the, of this, uh, uh, this session and if you're still here and you want to share the, this uh, information with your colleagues don't hesitate to send them off to the uh, recording as well um, when you do get to participate live it's great to have your usually we, we do have the opportunity for, for comments and discussion and unfortunately we didn't this time but uh, we'll certainly have our, our, our guests back uh, at some point in the future I'm sure to continue this conversation next week we'll be continuing our deep dive into some of these areas of interest to, to uh, the Children's Healthcare Canada members with respect to this election. Uh, next week on October 9th, we'll be talking about child and youth mental health, a national discussion on the readiness for change. And this will be, for this session, we'll be bringing experts from across Canada to look at things like a pan-Canadian mental health strategy for children and youth and what that might look like and how we can engage our federal government in supporting uh, that type of an initiative to address mental health for in Canada for children and youth. Um, so that's an exciting uh, session to come up next week. That'll be the final installment of our election series. Uh, and and the, the, the election at that point will only be about another week or two away from, from that. Um, so uh, it, again, if, you, if there's anything we can do here to support uh, your activities with respect to this election, don't hesitate 
hesitate to contact us here at Children's Healthcare Canada. Uh, one of the best ways to find out what we're up to here at Children's Healthcare Canada, including upcoming webinars, is to sign up for the Children's Healthcare Canada Spark newsletter, which you can find on our website at the front page of our website at childrenshealthcarecanada.ca. Uh, so thanks again, everyone, for joining us uh, today, and hopefully we'll see everyone back here for part four of our, our final part of our webinar series uh, next week. So uh, thanks again for coming, and we'll talk see you next week, hopefully. Bye, everyone. <laughs>